So hello, my name's Kev, and my presentation is called Overcoming Obstacles. Inspired Youth Arts is a not-for-profit social enterprise, and we use arts and media as a way of engaging with people to talk about their experiences and use arts and media as a way to communicate and convey that to the world. We're really in the business of telling stories, and we're in the business of raising awareness and tackling stereotypes and tackling stigmas. In order to sort of put into context what I do now, I wanted to first tell you a little bit more about my own story and how I sort of wound up doing this kind of work. There's a guy I met called Brendan Foley. He's a, he's a filmmaker from Belfast. And uh, when I first started getting into sort of telling my own story, because in my work, I'm telling other people's stories. So I'm working with different issues, sort of like young carers, children in care, adults um, in recovery, different sort of social issues, and we're using these tools and, and my skills and the skills of other artists to help people tell their stories. And I thought this was really relevant, what he said to me. We're all prisoners of our own past until we have the courage to set ourselves free. So that's what I'm doing. I'm having the courage to tell my story. So I was one of nine children to Irish parents who were from Belfast. My mum and dad... Um, my mum was pregnant out of wedlock, which at the time was socially unacceptable in their community, and they ran away to England. And at that time, um, my dad recalls that um, it was a time in, in life in Britain where the job centre had sort of signs in there saying, no blacks, no Irish, no dogs. So their start was in adversity, and I suppose this is all about hope over adversity. Now, in the early days, my dad was in the... He ended up in the British Army, and um, this is a sort of picture of... I'm in the middle there with bald head, looking quite um, happy to be around my brothers and sisters. And I think at this time we were like a middle-class family, so to speak. So my dad had a full-time job. We had a, we had a house supplied by the military, and um, we had a good life. But soon later, um, my dad was actually... Um, he was actually expelled from the army. And that's a different story for a different day. But it very much changed my upbringing. So I was a fifth child, and I sort of feel like my life was the sort of like changing point in, in, in what happened to us as a family. And uh, I like to call this one the human staircase, because it sort of like goes up from small to big. And that's me there with red T-shirt. This is a picture of me with my little brothers, Ronan on the left and Declan on the right. We talk a lot about, we hear a lot about sexual abuse in the papers. Like literally every day, if you open a newspaper in the last sort of six months, there's something in there about child sexual abuse. And I think it can sort of desensitize society to what that actually means. So I'd like to just stop there and sort of break it down a little bit. Child sexual abuse is lying in a bed with your eyes closed, tight and hearing the shadow and the noise of someone coming towards your bed and hoping and praying that what's going to happen isn't going to happen, but it does. And a feeling of shame and a feeling of sadness and a feeling of being trapped and a feeling of ice and coldness and sadness. Me and my brothers were all subject to child sexual abuse. And it was amidst a family breakdown. So mum and dad had nine children and their relationship became broken. And it was messy and it was horrible and it was difficult for us as kids. And ultimately, at this time, um, we were asked to basically give evidence because one of my brothers um, divulged what had happened to him. And so all of a sudden, social services got involved, the police got involved. And we were asked to stand, uh, to sit behind a mirror, uh, like a mirrored glass, where there was video cameras at the other side. And for the first time, to, to ex explain and describe in detail what had happened to us. And it was excruciating and difficult and heartbreaking. And my mum had to sit there and listen to it. But then we were told never to talk about it again. We were told that if we spoke about it and that the council offered us some support in counselling, that that could contaminate court evidence. So we're asked to speak about our experiences. We talk about the trauma. 
We, we explain it to adults and then we're told to, to keep our mouth shut, not to talk to each other, not to talk to the social workers, not to talk to mum, not to talk to dad, not to talk to anyone. So you express this hugely, massively impact, impactful experience and then have to stay si silent as a child. And ultimately, after a year of staying silent, Declan took his own life. And I'll never forget it because I was a 15-year-old. I was a teenager. You know, I was going through the hormones. Our life was pretty dysfunctional. The family was broken down. And I woke up that day and I'll never forget a scream. I'll never forget that sound. It's the, it's the most difficult sound I've ever had to listen to, the, the sound of my mum screaming. And I can remember running down the stairs. And I can remember running into the room and thinking, what's wrong, mum, what's wrong? And she was just sort of stood there quivering and whimpering. And I looked across and he was there in the doorway, hanging in, hanging in the doorway. And he's so innocent, and that's why I use that picture, because you can see the innocence and the youth. And for me, his death was a direct result of not being able to talk about it. My mum was actually told um, after his death by the Crown Prosecution Service, she was told um, to make a decision about whether she wanted to, after the death of my brother, whether she wanted us to actually stand trial, uh, stand on the trial and be cross-examined, and whether she really wanted to put her children through that, which I find, in retrospect, because I'm only learning about my story now by uncovering it and going back to it in retrospect, but I found that really difficult position to put a mother in that's devastated by this scenario. And I suppose one of the things I wanted to say today was about the fact that when you're a child, you don't hold the pen to your story. Someone else holds the pen to your story. So you could be brought up around violence. You could be brought up around sexual abuse. You could be brought up around parents that don't care, drug addiction. You don't get to choose that. It's only later in life when, if you can sort of make it through that ordeal and you can make it through that trauma, that actually you get the pen back. And that's what I'm doing now. I'm writing my own story. And I'm, I'm telling that story. And the shame that I felt as a victim, I refuse to feel ashamed because it's not me that should be ashamed. It should be the guy that abused us. And that's me with my little brother, Declan. Half, halfway through the... Uh, ah. So he takes his life and the guy that's... Um, the abuser basically is pleading not guilty to every charge. And he, he hears about my brother's death and decides that he's going to change the plea. But only on two counts, not for the rape of my brother. The Guardian called it a trial of error. And actually, my mum was able to make enough noise about it that it was, it was brought up in Parliament um, in an, an early day motion about not allowing young people in the future, young children, to be subjected to that silence when they've been through a traumatic experience. So obviously as a teenager, you've experienced this thing, you've seen it for yourself, and the thing that I always remember is seeing his body, but knowing he wasn't there. Like, that's a massively traumatic experience for a 15-year-old boy, and it hit me really, really hard. And basically, I just, everything eroded. I didn't care about my life. I didn't care about school. I didn't care about where I was going to go. I just sort of like became consumed by this pain and not being able to deal with it. And I didn't want to talk to social workers at this point. I didn't trust the system. I didn't trust the adults. I didn't trust anybody. So I sort of went on a warpath of self-destruction. And uh, it led me nowhere, just round in circles. And I, I remember abusing a lot of drugs and... Whenever I would come down and come back to earth uh, from that escapism, I was left with the reality of what I'd been through still and none of it had gone away. So I realized that it wasn't a solution. And, and so what I started to do is actually started to write it down. So I started to sort of write it down, like what, what, what I felt like, my emotions, the experiences that I'd been through. Uh, and one day my mum sort of sitting down in the front room and uh, she, um, she said, I found a bit of your writing, Kev. Um, she said, it's amazing, like, you should do that. You know, we felt really moved by it. And I, I realized that in expressing it for myself, I was helping myself, but in actually expressing it in, in a way that somebody else could learn or be inspired from, it was like an amazing thing as well. So she sort of encouraged me to, to do something with my life, as parents sort of do. And I, I went to, to, to college and uh, 
I, I was really nervous and I was really scared around other people. I, I was a bit awkward and I, I didn't find it very easy to communicate and become part of a, a, of a group. Um, and when I was 17, I took an overdose. I took 48 cocodamols and somebody, a friend of mine, Lizzie, who I went to school with, found me sort of swaying on a wall and got me some help. Um, but this is where my story sort of really changed, is that um, a tutor at the, at the college that I was doing, I'll show you in a minute, um, she sort of sat, sat me down and said, you know, what, you know what, Kev, you've got something. She said, I know your story and I know what you've been through and I want to say to you that I'm going to help you to get back on the course because I basically failed on attendance. I've passed all my modules, but I failed on attendance. So she said, I can't put you through. But she said, if you do it again, I'll help you. I'll help you get, I'll help you get back into it. And I saw it as like a massive window of opportunity. Like for the first time, I sort of stopped and thought, what if I don't take this chance? What if I just do, just like, you know, throw it all away and not really care? What, what, what would be different if I did? choose to believe in myself. I think it was like a little revolution inside of myself for an external person to sit in front of me and go, do you know what? I believe in you. And that's a massive thing. And I think really it just does take one person to believe in you, to start that revolution inside yourself. I passed my course. And um, at the time, I remember my uh, mate coming towards the, the end of the, this, the first year at uh, this re redoing this course. And uh, my friend was filling in a UCAS form. And I was like, what's, what's, what's UCAS form? It's like, oh, it's where you sort of like, you know, um, apply to go to university. And I was like, all oh, right, university, yeah. Cool. So I, I sort of thought, that's, that's what I want to do too. So I filled in a UCAS form and I got, got a place at Plymouth University. I chose, a, I chose a university as far away from York and all the people and all the drugs as possible. It took six hours on the train. And uh, I, I basically started a new life for myself. And uh, amazingly, I got a first class degree. I made a film about my brother. Um, well, it was dedicated to my brother. It was a film that had aspects of my life and I wanted to use that real story to, to do something tangible with my, my degree. And um, I got a first class degree and I got the Governor's Award that year for Student of the Year. And this is Alison Willis, who's going to absolutely kill me when she realises that's been streamed live on, on the internet. But she's an absolute legend and she was the turning point in my life. So, I, like, as I said, I made this film. It was called, in a sense, um, tri a tribute sort of to Declan and to, to, to remember his name. And it was student BAFTA nominated. It got a Royal Television Society Award. It was, I entered it into a film festival called the, Royal, um, the R RTS um, Film Festival. And Ridley Scott and Ewan McGregor on the, on the, on the judge panel there. And uh, I couldn't believe when I'd been recognised for this, this film. And it was amazing. It was an amazing time in my life. And uh, of course, the, the tutors there were like, right, so now what you need to do is you need to go to London and be a runner and uh, work for TV and then you'll sort of work your way up. And I was like, can't work for Chewing Gum TV, you know, I can't be working some sort of like TV production company that's not making anything that's actually about anything and it's just sort of like, you know, formulaic. So I came back to York, as you do after getting a first degree and worked in a homeless shelter um, because I was always really inspired to do something that made a difference. So I got this job in a homeless shelter and uh, every day I was meeting habitual alcoholics and people in the cycle of heroin addiction. And I became frustrated within that job because I didn't really feel like I could help these people. I was compassionate and I wanted to help them, but I really didn't feel like I could in that capacity. So I was like, right, I want to do, go back to what I went, you know, my dreams, which was creativity, telling stories. And uh, I used the opportunity to make a film, a documentary about the day in life of someone living on heroin. Um, but I really wanted it to be sort of about the human and about the person and who, who they were and what their story was and how they ended up there because everything you heard about them was, was negative and there was a negative connotation around it. But inside, there was a person there. There was a child from a broken home or a, a young person that missed the mum that got involved with this guy who was drunk this way. And, you know, I just wanted to do something that was real and that, that, that valued that person and that didn't define them as a label, but defined them as who they were and their story. After that, I did a bit of freelancing. I left the, the, the job and I did a bit of freelancing and I ended up in a job um, with E2E, which is, stands for Entry to Employment. And they were working with like 17 year olds that weren't in education or training. And basically I brought my film skills and we, um, mapped their learning of what they were sort of developing, their skills, communication skills, you know, teamwork, and we mapped that to their, their, their learning. And it really worked uh, until 
six months later when they lost the contract and made us redundant, and that's when Inspired Youth was born. So Inspired Youth Arts is basically, it's about telling people's stories. It's about engaging with um, real experience and putting that at the heart of creating campaigns, and that's what we do. We raise awareness, tackle stigma, we work with those closest to the issue, the content's all shaped by real experience, and we use collaboration, so where I'm doing a photography project, I'll bring in the best photographer I can find to make the quality of the production go up, um, work with the best designers, graffiti artists, creating arts experiences that are memorable that will, um, will make a lasting impact on the people that we work with. And we use professional spaces, so we'll take young people out of their comfort zone, young people that would never have been stepped, in, stepped foot inside a university wouldn't have ever dreamed of it and create projects in partnership that enrich what we can sort of provide. So I'm just going to show you a little clip of our work, which is going to be a bit of a challenge. But... We are a multi-award winning organisation. We are leaders of social change. We collaborate with leading organisations to influence hearts and minds. We are driven to change the world. We challenge stigma, break down prejudice and raise awareness. We use heart and passion to create powerful films that unlock limitless potential. We put real people at the heart of the journey. We share experience with the world to inspire hearts and minds. We share powerful stories that educate, challenge and inspire. We are Inspired Youth. Together we can achieve greatness. Aspire to more. The final thing that I wanted to leave you with was a sort of actual project, an actual product from one of the sort of projects that we've done. A few years back we were approached by Springboard who were um, a, an organisation working with children leaving care, children leaving the care system and um, they came to us and they said we've got, got a group of young people, um, basically they're in a place in their life where they're finding life difficult. They're finding it difficult to be motivated. They haven't got any inspiration. We want to do something with them that sort of lifts their self-belief and makes them think about what's possible. Um, and from talking to, to Springboard, it, it came apparent that these young people really did feel like their voices weren't being heard. Like They really wanted to talk about what their view of the care system was and, and how they'd felt about it. So um, we came up with this idea of creating a, a music video and a song. Um, that was about the experiences of, of young people in care and leaving care. And uh, we partnered with a university and um, we created this, it was driven by them, we created some characters um, which the young people sort of put their shared experience into and then we made that into a song with a professional uh, rap artist, Critical Powers, and a vocalist, Izzy Dawson. And the result of what happened was like, it's one of the most proudest pieces of my work um, and it was really just about sort of their voices and it's been a massive success and I'm really pleased to be able to share it with you. Bye. 
the age of nine, I went into care. I got home from school, they were already there. They were packing on my bags, I wonder what I've done wrong. I had my head in my hands, but when I looked, they were gone. They won't let me see my brother at all I'm always staring at walls Just wishing that he would call And the local authorities They push me to the side I just want to see my brother Wish the pain would subside One day I woke up And my mum wasn't there The kitchen was cold And the cupboards are bare Sometimes I'm feeling like my life isn't fair I've got no choice, no freedom, living in care They're always saying that I'm kicking off They'll rip me off, my best is never good enough It's like I'm invisible, I'm not giving up They keep putting me down, but I pick myself up The way they get treating me is changing where I end up Wrong. Been in the situation for too long, let's move on All these places I moved from are in the past All this loneliness and grief, I know it can't last Hear my voice, let me have a choice, please I can achieve if you could only believe If you could only see the passion inside I've been swallowing my dreams since the age of nine I changed my mind, I changed my mood If you know this, I'm moving to a place where hope is I'm not hopeless I'm sharing my experience to be supported Reaching out to a generation that doesn't feel important Everything familiar and everything is good Now all my memories are rushing back in a flood Relieved to feel like everything is fine I remember how to smile, I can see the sun shine Tell her that's been in care it's not easy going through this man it's real people real lives so my name's Kev my organization's called Inspired Youth I really do believe that everyone's got a light inside of them and sometimes life can really make it dull and, and try and put it out. And I always look at the opportunities that, that I'm getting in my life with the work that I'm doing. And, and every young person that I meet, I think of them like a little Declan, a little backpack of sort of problems that they've got and they just need believing in. So I've been Kev. Aspire some more. Thank you very much. <laughs>